We are constantly thinking about things that have longevity, but at the same time they have to have an edge. So good design is good style, I believe. When you're running a business and we're going through such a transformational year that none of us expected, uh, how do you keep seeing a path forward when you're not sure whether the things you're hearing or seeing either in the the retail tiller tape or on the news will affect your business in in a positive way or a negative way? There's a lot of different things to to consider. Um, so how are you handling 2020, Perry? Well, we know that things will be uh, are and will be affecting our business. So there's an element of doubt that we don't have. Um, obviously, our business um, does have a lot of uh, component with the uh, you know that's affected by the the lack of cross border um, you know human um, movement that, that you know we've been enjoying. Honestly, it's just a case of putting one foot in front of the other and making the decisions today that you think are the best with the information that you've got, knowing that tomorrow, likely, it'll be a different set of parameters and different decisions. It's been like that since the end of January. And, uh, you know, we've made so many plans and remade so many plans. Um, and it's all about versatility, um, you know, being able to think quickly, um, having a team that will move, um, move quickly. It's, uh, it's, it is really changeable at the moment, obviously. Um, and, and we don't have good visibility going forward. Uh, nobody does. Yeah. It's an interesting one. So let's pick up on some of those, a couple of those themes that at least that I've seen at New Zealand made is there was a a dip when tourists weren't allowed into New Zealand for retailers that uh, relied on the tourist trade to sell items that had a, a real meaning to those wanting to take something back to their country of New Zealand. Uh, and certainly luxury or high-end or sustainable uh, products feature quite highly in what tourists want. Uh, so th- there's that angle of, of not being able to access those potential customers. Then there's the, the kind of the upside of, as the Prime Minister talked about, level three, you can buy online through e-commerce. There was this almost uh, wholesale shift of, of domestic uh, consumers who were stuck in their houses that thought, well, maybe I'll start supporting local businesses by buying online. Um, what was your experience of, of either of those uh, moments throughout 2020? Well, obviously, we certainly experienced the, the drop in international spend or spend from internationals, both here and in Australia, but actually around the world, because when you look at luxury, um, high-end products, a huge proportion of that spend happens when people are on holiday or when they're traveling. Uh, it just seems to be a time that they, they do spend um, you know, quite a lot. A lot of our, our customers are really busy people and, and that's when they've got a few moments to spare. So there's no question that that was a major impact. But we've been absolutely blown away by how incredibly the New Zealand market and also the Australian domestic market has supported um, Untouched World through through this time. I mean, we, we really are incredibly grateful um, and a little bit astonished uh, because we all thought that, um, you know, that the, uh, you know, the people would be thinking about their own situation and how long their own finances were going to last and so on. And we thought there might be a bit of a pullback on on that. So, yeah, that's been um, something that we absolutely didn't anticipate. We did budgets back in May and we just came those budgets on the way through. I mean, we're still down, obviously, because the, um, you know, that massive international spend is, is huge. Um, but it's it's been um, really, really heartwarming, actually. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, that's great to hear because I know, you know, when we look at the the big numbers, they're almost a little bit more, they're more faceless is that, uh, you know, Kiwi spend $2 billion on flights overseas or 5 to $6 billion on consumption when they're overseas. So that money has been sitting in New Zealanders' pockets. But what does it actually mean when they, they go on to the Untouched World website or they go back into your, your store at Willis Street in Wellington and, uh, and want to start to purchase something which uh, shares the story that they are making a sustainable purchase or uh, making a local purchase? What are the products that um, are popular with Kiwis? I think um, we've been a little bit lucky that we've been positioned really nicely for the shift that's been going on globally, but here in New Zealand and in, in Australia, you've had um, people at home, sort of casualization of um, people's wardrobe needs. And so um, we fit right in there. Uh, and, it, you know, we're a really easy go-to place for, for, for meeting those needs. And I certainly think we've had some uptake on that. I do think people are thinking more about what they're buying and what that means. And uh, I think I, I get the sense that the whole notion of fast fashion and, um, you know, having a different, every, different outfit for every Instagram picture is not cool at the moment. It's, not, it's just, it's not even not desirable. It's not cool. Uh, and, you know, there's a different sense going on out there. So what we're about is clothes that transcend the time, they're multitasking, um, they're, they're really comfortable, feel-good clothes that, that you have in your wardrobe. And, and I think it's been really nice for us that Kiwis have been able to, um, for whatever reason, find us. And, um, and start to experience what we have. I think the masks, we got right into masks early on. I think that certainly helped uh, for, you know, people to come and buy a mask and think, oh, have a look at this brand. <laughs> so that's happened around the world a wee bit too, which has been good. So that, that's been good. Getting into masks, I think, it was a, a very shrewd move by by any company because, uh, it becomes almost like a staple that you must have it. Uh, and if you're going to buy something, as you say, what else is this company offering that maybe I could purchase a scarf exactly. or a, yeah. a, a jacket and so on? Because there's something in that mindset. I know where, you know, if I'm going to check out, it's actually quite a, a hassle to, to go through that checkout process online. So you think, well, what else can I put in my shopping cart? right now so I don't have to go through it again uh, maybe in a week or two um, yeah no, I, I agree and when we I mean we put a huge amount of effort into the masks we've got Callahan, Callahan Innovation involved at one stage I had five different um, scientists firing papers at us we were studying what happened in Hong Kong as what was coming out of the CDC what was coming out of France and we took it all pretty seriously and um, but I kept thinking that you know that might actually help Untouched World find its way into the minds and hearts of a wider um, bunch of people than we would otherwise have that opportunity to. So that was kind of our driver um, for getting into that. Yeah. And on the science side of it, I, I mean, I see on your your website here, you, you've actually got three different types of masks and not just styles but these are actually you've got uh, cotton ones which is the barrier for large droplets whereas you've also got the merino ones which are better breathing they're moisture wicking and then you've got the ones with the the helix filter in them for um, the the full protection quite an interesting strategy actually to go with um, to provide kiwis options depending on what level of protection they wanted to have yeah, well, we decided that, uh, you know, which fitting with the brand, um, we wanted to produce the best masks that there are. Um, so short of having an N95 mask, you know, you, your mask needs to fit. It needs to, um, you know, it needs to be a really good filter. It needs to be easy to breathe or people won't continue to wear it. 
uh, and there's such a lot just in the engineering of it actually and in the in the fit um, but also making sure that we were educating people on how to put them on how to take them off how to launder them so that you know they didn't end up re reinfecting them but we knew that not everybody would want to go to that level or pay that amount of money um, so that's why we we um, put together that entry level mask, which is simpler uh, and it's better than no mask, a lot better than no mask. So that was kind of our strategy in putting together those um, those three options. And you've got some people that like the idea of merino and the anti antibacterial aspect of it, and others that said, no, I would never want merino near my face. So it was kind of making sure that we had enough options, but not so many that people couldn't actually make a decision. Um, on on what they wanted to buy, so yeah. Now, Untouched World, you've got quite a lot of experience in the the actual raw materials, the the fabric side of it. You know, way before the demand for face masks uh, came about. Uh, what are some of the the raw materials that you're excited about that goes into some of the uh, apparel and fashion that you make? Um, well, obviously, you know, we've come a long, long way uh, with Merino. Uh, it's such an amazing fibre. But latterly, we've been um, doing some really um, fun things with um, fibres uh, or fabrics that have come from byproduct of food products such as soybean. We've got a fantastic, uh, very lightweight, gorgeous um, soybean fabric that we make into um, summer apparel is beautiful to wear uh, and then there's an aloe vera one and uh, that's been really interesting sort of working into the different fibers that are coming onto the market now because when we started down this path about 20 years ago it, you know there just wasn't the range of different um, materials as you know most of the materials were reasonably clunky apart from merino um, and then obviously we started off the whole um, possum fiber blended with merino industry um, because you know that was a fiber that was being wasted and it was an amazing fiber it's hollow and it um, doesn't pill and it's very light and it's got lots and lots of great qualities and so, you know, that's really great for a winter product, but you're not going to want to wear that on a hot summer's day. Merino, you can wear on a hot summer's day, and it's, 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 it's a really good thing to wear because it breathes so well, and, um, and you don't get cold. I remember being in a, um, at a conference in Hong Kong uh, with my daughter, and we were outside, and it was really, really hot, and you get really, you know, your skin gets moist when you're out in the big high heat then you go inside and the air conditioner screwed right down and it's really cold and if you're not wearing something that's wicking the moisture away then you've got this layer of moisture on your skin and you freeze so then you get cold <laughs> so you know it, it is a really good summer um heat heat product but it's just so wonderful to have these other other materials coming through that we're really enjoying um, using we use another one um, called tensile which comes from eucalyptus trees and that's you know, just a nice light summer weight one which which we use in our prints and so on so it's a constant quest for more interesting fabrics yeah is the the quest to look for different uh, raw materials like the the soya bean that you talked about or the eucalyptus oil or uh, the aloe vera is that uh, to simply source a material that is going to work for the, the apparel needs that you have, or is it because it's fitting into that broader narrative that you support around sustainability and actually securing supply for the, the products you want to make without um, conflicting with um, the sustainable practices that you want to engender for your, for your customers? Actually, um, it's actually both. You know, we create a lifestyle wardrobe. So we're constantly looking for the types of fabrics that will meet what we think meet, meet the needs of our customers. So if we think that they would like to have a raincoat, 
we're going to go out and look for a raincoat material that ticks the boxes of sustainability because we're, you know, we're really concerned about our environment. You know, the, the hundreds of thousands and millions of microfibers that get washed down the drain and into the sea. I actually feel quite passionate about this thing. So we can't feel com comfortable um, creating things out of materials that we know are going to ultimately um, make the environment worse off or alternatively uh, not be looking after the people that are, um, are producing it, whether it's the farmers and the insecticides with the cotton or, or what. So, um, so it's, a, it's we're definitely looking at all of the new materials that are available and saying, how would they fit in? to our assortment and do they really fit in because you have to look under the leaves you have to actually look past the um you know the the stories at the moment we're having a big thing around compostable plastic bags you know a lot of um a lot of the solution has been thought to be to move to to um compostable plastic bags but but they're no good. They break down into micro fragments and, um, and into the environment and they'll be there forever. So, you know, you're still trying to look for some of those um, alternative um, materials, which will probably come from algae or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> A constant quest, as is finding the the talent for the people to actually make the, the clothes. And I know that... Um, there's almost been a, a renaissance in uh, sewing and finding machinists for the the you know, unexpected demand on on face masks. Um, you've got your team or most of your team in, in workrooms in Christchurch. Is that right? Uh, we do. We do. Uh, we. I mean, we are at core a, a knitting operation, and uh, we have. Um, machinists and sewers here on site but most of our sewing we outsource to um, to sewers either working at home or to other companies such as Albion um, which um, you know you were talking to recently uh, so uh, but all of the knitting um, and the makeup and the, and the, the um, construction of the knitting including the sewing um, goes on in here uh, because of the, the, the high quality needed. But all of those skills are really hard to find now. They really are. So um, it's really great that you know Mindful New Zealand's getting on to that. Um, because we do need we need the whole picture here in New Zealand. And there's so many people that would benefit from being able to have a career in in this industry, you know, think about the staircase casing that goes on. Our production manager at the moment, which pretty much pretty much runs our company, you know, the whole production side of our company, she arrived in as a cleaner twenty years ago, um, and we've she's she's amazing, but she's gradually worked her way up. She went away for a few years and came back. And, you know, she hadn't had that opportunity to come in as an unskilled somebody. What would she have done? I don't know. Hey, just a quick interruption. Thanks for watching a Kiwi Original. If you're liking this episode, then hit the notification button. And that means you'll see when every new episode gets released. We've done 40 already. We've got another 50 lined up. Right, now back to the episode. It's about giving people the the opportunity, and I think that uh, that if you have the right attitude and work ethic, then manufacturing is a, a very good uh, long career uh, that you can have within a business. There's, there's you know there's just so many facets to it, you know from you know from the engineering side, the technical side, the creative side. You know the design side, the whole office, you know backgrounds side, supporting the business. It's, it's it's huge and it's incredibly rewarding, making, producing, producing things, producing them really well. Yeah, it's was, never done. <laughs> I, I was talking to uh, um, I think another um, fashion apparel company and saying that 
uh, the the skills coming out of university or high school. Everyone wants to be a designer. No one wants to be a machinist. Yet the best designers actually understand the tools, and you have yeah, to get on the totally. tools for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, Ab- absolutely. Um, there, and it's it's a it's a real shame we think that so many of the, the designers have been coming out of university. I kind of expecting to be able to jump into a design um, a design role. They absolutely do need all of those those um, those skills. They need to know how garments are going to go together. They need to know how to optimize the materials. Uh, it, that's what makes them a really good designer. In fact, on the other side of the business with the with the knitwear, you know, the first thing we used to do when they came in is is make sure that they knew how to knit. They knew how to form a stitch. Uh, because if they don't know how to form a stitch, how are they going to design? How are they going to design a new stitch? So, um, yeah, and it's having that patience for them to be able to work their way through um, through the business and um, and come out the other side. One of our designers came to us as a graduate from RMIT in Melbourne, and a year and a half later, she was whipped away back to Australia um, by a man, her husband, which we were very grumpy about. Because it take, you know, it takes that long to, to get someone going. But fortunately, um, he brought her back again. So she's been back now for probably, I guess, eight years and um, and she's great. But it, you know, she said that she learned more in three months here than in three years at university. Would, uh, on that, would your advice be to someone that wants to get into the fashion industry, maybe to, to skip the university and, and just get in and do some of the, the, the less glamorous parts of fashion, getting on the machines and, and work your way up? No, not necessarily. Um, I think there's some real positives in university and, and what's taught. But if you're really hungry to get ahead in the industry, um, do the practical stuff alongside. Go and get a job. Go and do some outwork. Go go and um, work for a company alongside doing your um, your degree, and you'll be all set when you get to the other end. That's um, uh, that's exactly my advice, and and we we preach it here at, at Buy New Zealand Made. I've got Hugo to my left here, who does all of the the film production, who you briefly met at the start. And he's third year at university. So uh, he's learning right. on the job application of some of the theory. Yeah. So that, you know, when a light doesn't work or the audio doesn't work, it's it contextualized some of the learning to actually sometimes you just need to have a spare set of AA batteries on you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Or turn it on. <laughs> yes, that's usually um, that's usually where I go wrong. I, f- I forget the the very basics. Yeah. Um. So so on the design side, you've got um. I, I saw from my notes there, Fiona Bretherton's been working as a designer within Untouched World for um, twelve years now. Um. Even back to the the predecessor name for Untouched World, Snowy Peaks. Uh, what is the what have you seen in terms of the the shift in trends of um, you know what? What are some of the things that you would design back then that are, are timeless, versus some of the things you've you've had to shift or see shifting in terms of you know fashion per se? Well, um, Fiona's on our um, on our knitwear side, and we've got two brands. One is called Merino Mink, which was quite strongly focused for the tourist market. So we used to think about who's coming to New Zealand and Australia and to other countries that we sell to, which demographics and and how to access the desire of those of those demographics. And that's a very different way to build a brand or build um, to to grow a business. Uh, than it is with something like Untouched World where you look at what your feeling is and what your philosophy is and you're looking at all of the people um, globally that follow that or fit in or enjoy that kind of aesthetic. So um, so in terms of what's changed from when Fiona first came here, we used to have a big 
um, component of Japanese tourists visiting us here. In fact, Japanese were all over the world. You, you couldn't help. It was really hard to try and guide the business away from being so reliant on, on Japanese. And the garments were incredibly pictorial. Sheep and kiwis and <laughs> um, flowers and mountains and, you know, all sorts of things that would, would, would remind or make them think about, take something home and remind them of the lovely holiday they had. Now, that, that market has completely matured now, and it's a fashion market. Um, so you, there's no way that you would be selling sweaters with kiwis and sheep and so on. And, you know, they're up with the trends like everyone else's uh, in globally. And likewise, um, China and some of those other emerging markets, they've emerged more fashion forward than um, than Japan did. You've got to think about, if you think about sort of around about World War, end of World War, the Japanese were wearing overalls. Um, you know, so they, they you know, weren't growing up with, um, you know, with these aesthetics. So now um, with Fiona, or, you know, with what we're, we're developing, we're, we're, we are constantly thinking about things that have longevity, but at the same time, they have to have an edge. So good design um, is good style, I believe. Um, and it just needs to have that little bit of something about it that generally doesn't date. You know, we always said, if, if purple's the hot colour, we're not using purple, because if it's the hot colour this year, it'll be the no colour next year. Um, you think about a guy's jackets are super wide lapels are hot at the moment. You create a piece with super wide lapels. It ain't going to sit around and come out of that wardrobe for, for a long time. It's going to look very dated. So it's just trying to find that balance, trying to think about the customers, trying to make the customers look good and feel good. And honestly, a lot of the pieces that we designed 20 years ago, people are still wearing. Um, in fact, they'll come back to us and say, look, I bought this eight years ago and it's worn out, I need another one. Um, and they can get really disappointed if it's not still in the range. Um, having said that, there is newness and freshness coming through and it's a constant balance. Um, trying to get it right. Yeah. What advice would you give to a businesswoman or businessman who is now constantly in these types of meetings, these Zoom calls where, uh, you know, the, the look is still important like a physical meeting, but there are different aspects to it because of where you might be having that Zoom call from home or the, like I know that there were certain meetings that I would have gone to previously and a full suit and tie, uh, but to meet that same individual in a remote environment, it would feel quite overdressed to be wearing a, a tie at home. Um, what what are some of the, the things that you're seeing work well um, with the Untouched World range in this new virtual uh, world of meeting? I, yes, that's really interesting that you mentioned that because that, that's where I think things have moved and I think you know, it just looks really silly if if you are over, you know, over formalized for a Zoom meeting. Everyone knows you're at home, um, but at the same time, you know, you you're running a business. You need to be smart and styly, but at the same time, comfortable and relaxed. And I think that's that's you know where where we come in, where we fit really really easily. Um, in in that space. I mean, you're not going to sit at home, as you say, with your, your jacket and your tie on, and uh, unless you're a newsreader, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I found that it worked uh, for some of the, the live TV crosses uh, because they, you know, they expect you to be wearing a, a suit and tie. It's a, it's a formal broadcast network, but for the for the Zoom calls, I, I did get called out a couple of times, so very quickly changed uh, changed that approach. Um, Perry, is there anything else that uh, I haven't asked you or that um, we we should have covered in our, our chat before we wrap up? I think probably we might want to cover a little bit about the the sustainability part of 
what we do. I know we've touched on it with the fabrics, but um, we so something's a really big part of what we do is the our Untouchable Foundation and our Leadership for a Sustainable Future programs, and it's kind of intertwined with the business. And our, our desire with that was to try and make a difference beyond the reach of the company. So we've got that reach with the company, with the fabrics, the materials, people that put the garments together and, and all of that. And so beyond that, we decided that um, we, we had a big think about it. We're into our 20th year with that. Uh, and our thinking was that we would, um, the, best, the best difference we could make was to open the eyes of young adults as to what is going on in the world, what needs to happen in the world, and facilitate them to find that leader within, um, which is something that happened to me early on. I don't know if I would have known there was a leader inside there if somebody hadn't kind of dug it out and made sure I knew it was there. And so that's something that uh, we feel um, really strongly about and it's something that really drives us and I think it really helps those people that we were talking about just a few minutes ago where we, they're sewing and making garments. So some of the people have been here for 20 years, 25 years. And they get, you know, they talk about the being something bigger um, that they're working towards. And uh, that, I think, is a real change of what's going on globally. And I think this whole COVID um, situation is accelerating this, this quest for meaning, um, you know, the need for meaning in work. So our, um, some of our, our team, we might have a breakfast here and talk to them about what we're doing in the foundation. We might get some of the kids that have been through the programs to come and talk to them. And quite often I'll get somebody who's been sitting on a sewing machine or a linker come through with a crinkled up $20 note and say, can you please put this towards the foundation, which I think is pretty huge. Um, so I, I think that's something that New Zealand can really build on, uh, is, is that extra meaning that we can all put into our work in this country that we're so lucky to, to work in. We are very uh, fortunate indeed. Um, is there any example that, that comes to mind with uh, the foundation? Because you must have seen over that period of time um, some pretty amazing transformations as uh, the the leader within uh, gets revealed to someone who who maybe saw a, a seed of it or a start of it or felt the kind of the opposite of it that the frustration of not being able to express it and then you've you've given them that space through the foundation um, yeah what what would be a, an example so I can give you two examples two um ends of the spectrum. Um, so, so early on, like very early on, we had, we were running programs for um, special needs um, young adults. And so our alumni, our leaders were leading these, these kids. And we had a girl from Salisbury College in Nelson who was on camera at the beginning of one of these programs, head down, wouldn't, wouldn't communicate, wouldn't talk, didn't want to be there, didn't want to go on the program. And six days later, she's saying, I want to come back as a leader. And, and she did from, from the next year. So there was just a transformative change for her. Um, and then I've just been up in um, Kaikoura with our Advanced Leaders Program, and this, this is a sort of a select group of about 20 um, who have been tasked with thinking about what's a moonshot, what, what, do we, what do we want to do next, and what can make it a huge difference. So one of, the, one of our outstanding students is now leading our um, junior board. Um, his name's Matt. And um, he was selected by the UN to go to the out of one of 20, I think, globally to go to a um, 
to a youth conference and then he ended up playing an absolute major part in that youth conference and he's an absolutely outstanding guy. Um, whether he would have found that leader within at some stage somehow, I don't know, but certainly he's, um, you know, it's, he's absolutely um, flowering, which is wonderful. When's the, the next intake and uh, who, should, who should consider applying? So uh, we do them four times a year. Um, well, we've got four programs running at the moment. And the best way for people to find out about them is to just jump on um, our, our website and, um, and register and then just see the emails coming through because we'll, we'll um, notify it through email that applications are open. We do work mostly with schools. Um, and um, and have them and work through with them, but yeah, it's the best way. I'll make sure that in the show notes we we link through to the the foundation website uh, okay. as well as cool. your your own website, so that uh, any participants listening or uh, can think about uh, putting in a, an, an application, or maybe it's for one of their their sons or, or daughters. Exactly. Yep. Thank you very much, Perry, for being on the Akiwi Original show. It's certainly um, always good to hear from a business that is doing more than just business, is giving back to the community and paying it forward for those who have helped you go the the way that uh, you've managed to achieve with Untouched World over nearly four decades in fashion. That is a phenomenal uh, amount of time and contribution to New Zealand. So. Thank you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do in paying it forward and really appreciate your time today. Pleasure. Thank you. This has been a Kiwi original brought to you by the New Zealand Made team. Thanks for watching. Uh, the New Zealand Made trademark is used by over 1,200 businesses in New Zealand. Uh, the New Zealand Made team licenses that trademark. Check if you're eligible at buynz.org.nz. If you feel that someone should see this, share it with them now. Otherwise, subscribe to youtube.com forward slash buynzmade and we'll see you on the next episode.